<laughs> okay, cool. So how many of you do OAuth at work? Good, good, good. And the other ones are doing it as, as well because it's everywhere these days, really. Yeah. So I've been, um, I've been focusing on, you know, authentication, authorization technologies for the last, I don't know, 15 years or so. And um, been focusing on OAuth and OpenID Connect for the last 10 years. And, you know, when you're doing that stuff for such a long time, am I too loud, by the way? <laughs> okay. Um, then you start to drill in more details and more details, and you're doing these talks about these very specific things and advanced topics and so on. Um, but this year marks an interesting uh, turning point in OAuth because there will be um, the first ever revision to the specification after 10 years. Yeah? And this revision to the specification, you know, we are all developers, I guess, so you know semantic versioning, right, where you just add stuff and don't break existing stuff. It's just the other way around. It's reverse semantic versioning. They just removed stuff and didn't add anything. But that, that is a good thing because, you know, this technology has been around for over 10 years and some of that w were good ideas back then and some of them didn't work that well, right? So they decided that this year... Uh, it's going to be the time where they um, look at the spec again and remove all the things that you would not use anymore today. Which means the spec is, well, it's not getting smaller, but <laughs> at least there's less to learn. Okay? Um, and it's called OAuth 2.1, and that's basically uh, what I'm... Basically, the, the plan today is to just focus on these useful things. Okay? Um, and it's an introductory talk. Okay, so if you are an OAuth expert, you might be bored, yeah? But that's the, that's the exact intention here. It's, it's starting from scratch and trying to, in 60 minutes, give you as much OAuth as you need, so to speak, yeah? So don't complain afterwards, like, oh, that was too basic. No, that's the intention, okay? It's, I'm trying to be as basic as possible. Um, also, which is probably one of my favorite, most favorite outcomes of this talk, is that people come to me and say, you know what? I thought I know OAuth, but I was wrong. <laughs> so, you, you know, now, now that you strip away all the unnecessary stuff, it's easier to see the, the trees in the wood, so to speak. Okay? So, so that's kind of the intention of that. Yeah? Good. My name is Dominic. Um, as I said, I work for this for way too long. Um, and also, for the better half of my career, was working on an implementation of OAuth called Identity Server. It's an open source project. Um, and, you know, that means when you're implementing this, you have to read those specs more than once, typically. So, I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time reading those specs. And it's not everybody's cup of tea. I totally get that, right? I mean, it's using a career font, and that doesn't sound like fun, right? There are all these RFCs and so on. Um, yeah, so that's why I'm here and trying to put it into plain English as much as a German can, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, so just to give you some context, yeah, that is the short history of web-based authentication and authorization. It all started in 2005 with the mother of all protocols called SAML 2P, yeah, and some of, the, some of you might use that still today. Um, and it was like the first ever protocol that... Um, that invented this uh, request-response style of authentication where you have a browser, you send the browser somewhere, then the browser calls you back, right? And then you process a response, you know, that challenge-response style. That was what SAML 2P invented, yeah? And everything that came afterwards is basically just the same, right? Just using different technologies. So, yeah, that's that. Then there was WS Federation, WS Trust, you know, like the, the, the dark times of XML, I guess. Um, and then, and that, that's very important to understand, yeah? OAuth 1.0 in 2007 was a direct counter-reaction to those complicated XML-based protocols. They want to build something simpler, yeah? So they, they, they started reimagining this and focusing more on, on specific um, use cases. And maybe too specific, because shortly after, they added OAuth 2.0, which added more use cases again. Yeah? And we will talk about this. Um, and then, as you can see, there are a whole bunch of additional specifications that happened between 2012 and today. Okay? And these, these are the ones we are not going to talk about. 
Yeah, because they are just, you know, they are a distraction for now. Um, but here, this is the, the O of 2.1 um, um, that I mentioned earlier. So that is going to be the ever first update to the original spec um, to make it more modern, I guess. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's kind of like the big picture. And of course, this gave me finally the chance to do a talk that, that is called The Good Parts. Right? Um, you, you probably all know this book, right? JavaScript, The Good Parts, where the, the, the left one is all of JavaScript and the, the right one is the, the good parts. <laughs> um, so I'm all about here teaching you the good parts. And then once you appreciate the good parts, obviously it makes sense to know some of the bad parts as well and why you should avoid them. Yeah, but again, that's not our topic. We, 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 we're going to do the happy path. Okay? Good. So, the, the agenda is this. So, uh, first of all, why does OAuth exist, right? And then we're going to talk about what they call protocol flows, and there are really two left. So, OAuth started with five different flows or protocol flows in the original spec, and there are two left of them, which means the other three don't care anymore. But it doesn't matter. Yeah? Um, then we're going to talk about typical applications you would build with these flows. And then um, maybe you've heard over and over, for example, guys like me saying OAuth is not authentication. And we're going to have a talk, talk about why. Yeah? And then I'll give you some more, more pointers to further reading um, literature, if, if you want to dig deeper into the topic. Cool. So why does OAuth exist, right? As I said earlier, OAuth was a direct reaction to the enterprisey world of the beginning of 2000, right? XML and SOAP and namespaces and all of that complicated stuff. And uh, Google basically said, hey, um, we're building these consumer-facing APIs and we have a very simple problem to solve. How can, a third how can you give a third party access to your Google Calendar without you having to expose your password to the, fir to the third party? Right? They obviously didn't want that you type in your Google password into a third-party service. They wanted something else, right? something that allows you to grant someone access to, to, a, to data or even a subset of your data without exposing your master secret, so to speak. Right? And um, obviously, this was all based on, um, we, 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 we don't call them web services anymore, right? because that's XML and that's, that's evil. Yeah? So they call them APIs or web APIs or HTTP APIs. Well, well, you know whatever we're going to call them, yeah? Um, but it turned out this whole XML, SOAP, SAML era invented one really good concept, which are tokens. Okay, so instead of sending your password to a service, you're sending a token to a service, and that token represents access to some data or a subset of data for a limited amount of time, without having to expose your password, okay? So that was a good thing, um, but it was XML, right? I mean, they looked like this, and you probably all remember that, right? Where you basically have 95% uh, headers and a little bit of payload, <laughs> right? Um, but it turns out um, the ideas in that, they were good, right? Because they had... They introduced the concept of issuers and signatures, meaning who created the token, do I trust this person? And to technically enforce that trust, it was digitally signed. So we can validate the signature. If the signature uh, validation succeeds, we know it's coming from a trusted issuer. Google, for example, or whoever, right? Um, it had another uh, interesting concept called a time window, right? As a, 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 in contrast to your password, which was a long-term secret, yeah, these tokens could be short-lived, could be valid for one hour, for one day, for one week, whatever makes sense for your, for your business uh, case. Um, it had the concept of scoping. You know, again, contrasting it to your password, your Google password gives anyone access to everything you own in Google. But a token can be scoped to just for just the calendar API, for just the, the Gmail API, for just the, the Drive API, or even saying uh, uh, email read permissions, but not write, right? These things. So that's a concept coming from SAML tokens. Um, the, the concept of putting authentication context information into, into tokens, like who is the user? How did he authenticate? Is it strong enough for us? Things like that, yeah? Came from here. Uh, and ultimately claims. So if you live in the Microsoft space, you might think Microsoft invented claims. They did not. 
Yeah, they just reuse the concept coming from the SAML working group to basically give you a key, pa a key value pair style of expressing identity information about the user. Yeah? And again, this was all very convoluted, right? They had like XML namespaces and, and all of that. And we wanted to make that simpler. Yeah? And the main problem with this, with this technology, otherwise maybe we, we, we would still have it, was that it didn't work. <laughs> and, and what I mean with it didn't work is it did not work with the requirements of a consumer style world, right? So we might have been lucky to make two WCF services talk to each other, right? But have you ever tried making a WCF, WCF service talk to the thing from Sun or the thing from someone else, right? I mean, you first had to find an XML parser that understands both dialects, right? So this was not going anywhere. Yeah? They, they, they wanted a, a, basically an easy way, bring up some developer documentation. Here's how you call our API. It's JSON-based, right? You make a post request, send us this data, attach this token. It should work without having a PhD in angle brackets, right? So that is um, the, the one requirement, that it basically was all designed for third-party consumption, right? Whereas all of the enterprise stuff was mostly optimized for first-party consumption, right? You are accessing your own services because we're using the same technology stack on client and on, on the server. Yeah? The other thing was the enterprise did not care about humans, right? I mean, you were an employee of a company. You, you log into your AD account. You access AD company resources. Um, no one asks you, like, do you want this application to access your calendar, right? I mean, they were all owned by the company. Whereas in the consumer space, right, this is not true. The, the, the third party application that might want to add value to your calendar is not written by Google, right? Um, so Google very much had an interest of saying, hey, are you okay with granting uh, third party X access to your calendar and put the human into the picture? And that is called a consent screen. I'm, I'm sure you all have seen that before, right? Do you want to expose your email address? And most people just blindly click yes, because no, I don't know what no does. <laughs> um, so these were requirements, okay? And they did not work with the XML soap, soapy style stuff we had before, right? And that, that's, that, that were all um, uh, motivations for creating OAuth, yeah? So how does, what's OAuth, right? So basically the idea is very simple, yeah? Um, and, and I'm deliberately using the terms from the spec so that when you go back to the talk, to the recording, and you want to read the spec, you find the same terms. They are not very commonly used in normal language today, right? But the idea of OAuth was basically you had resources, a calendar, a, a, an inbox, right? Whatever. And these resources are running on a resource server, which we now today call APIs, typically, okay? Um, and then alongside of that resource server, you have another thing called the authorization server. And that is the thing that can determine if someone is allowed to access your resources, okay? And that is also the thing that will create these tokens that then the client application can use to consume those services, okay? And they are always together. Yeah? So the, the assumption is that the, the, the resource server and the authorization server are always owned by the same entity. Right? The, 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 the company that exposes the resources has a resource server, yeah? either their own or as a service, whatever, but they belong together um, and, and trust each other. That's the important part here. Yeah? Um, then we have clients. Okay? So clients are the applications that want to access the resources. Yeah. Um, there are different types of clients, right? There are, ultimately, there are clients running in the browser and clients running outside of the browser. That's basically all we have, right? Um, most of them run in the browser, uh, like web applications, you know, spas, things like that. Uh, we have mobile applications, which maybe use the browser for authentication, but the main app is native, right? And we have classic server-to-server -server style communication. Yeah? Some of these clients are considered to be confidential, and they are basically boiling down to things that run on a server, right? So someone installs them, you give them a client ID and the client secret so they can authenticate with you. These, these, the secret is stored securely on a server, maybe on something that you own, or maybe on a business partner server, or whatever, right? Uh, whereas the, uh, the so-called public client are the ones that you can't control, like mobile devices or 
a JavaScript application. They, they run outside of your control and they are considered less, uh, less confidential than the ones running on, on server hardware, right? Also less exposed to attacks and, and all these things. Some of these clients have users, okay? And uh, the OAuth spec calls them resource owners. And what they mean is, is that they own some data on the resource server. But I think that is a very misleading term. We call them users these days, typically, okay? And there, you see that there's a very important distinction between users and clients. So users are human beings, okay? Carbon-based life forms in, in, in your system, yeah? They have some sort of account with you and they have some sort of data that is stored with you, okay? And these humans want to use an application to access the data, right? And these are the clients. Some clients might be coming from you, first-party clients, some, part, some clients might be coming from a third party. You know, if you have a, a public API, there might be clients out there that, that you don't even know about, right? Someone wrote them because you want them to write those clients to access your APIs and, you know, have a business model behind that. So that's that. And then regardless um, how you um, access the system, it's always the same. First of all, the client needs to make a round trip to the authorization server and ask for a token, right? Uh, it's, it's called the authorized request very often. Yeah? So I want to get authorized to access a, a resource. Yeah? And then if all is good, then the authorization server returns that token. And from that point on, the client is using the access token to access the APIs. And again, access tokens have all of these good things, right? They might, they might be limited to a subset of the APIs. They might have a limited time window. You might re even revoke them and so on, right? So all of the good things that tokens can, can give us as opposed to shared secret style security with passwords, yeah? Good, so that's that. And that's how it always works. Uh, we could stop here, that's how it works. <laughs> Let's have a look at one very important concept in OAuth, yeah, which, which they call the scope. Yeah, and the scope is very, very loosely defined. But the idea is, is that um, in your system, right, these resources here, you give them logical names, right, like calendar API or email API, whatever, right? And then you basically can configure which client is allowed to access which resource. And the parameter on the protocol that expresses the, the, the thing you want to access is called the scope parameter, yeah? And as you can see, and that's typical OAuth style, uh, is it's just a string. Um, if you, you can have more than one value on it, and if, if that's the case, it, it is space delimited. Um, and typically, the assumption is, is the more strings you have on that parameter, the more access you have to the system, right? Calendar would be one. Uh, Inbox might be another, but you also might say calendar and inbox because you are a client application that needs to access both. Yeah, which um, is just the way it's done these days. Um, but let me just give you some examples um, um, of how certain APIs implement the scope concept. So, so that's from the, from the GitHub developer documentation, right? So basically what the, the, their, their view of the world is, we have this one GitHub API or resource server, if you like, in the, in the OAuth speak, and it has certain types of functionality, right? There's access to repos, access to user information, access to packages, right? And then you, your client basically needs to, when, when it does the authorized request, needs to say, hey, please give me access to repo and to read packages, okay? Um, and sometimes, as I said, um, they also need, need, need to go a little bit fine grainer, right? So maybe, maybe it makes sense to, to split it up into write packages and read packages, maybe on your CI server. The token you have there, the client only needs to read from the package feed, but there's no point in giving, giving them write access to it, right? That's how you can scope it down, I guess. That's where the, where the, where the name comes from, yeah? Um, also funny to see, right? Software evolves, underscores, colons, and so on. So it's, you know, it, it's been in, in evolving for, I guess, 10 years or so. That is how GitHub is doing it. Uh, in contrast, that's how Google is doing it, for example, yeah? Coming back to Google. Um, you, you know that, that I guess the fundamental difference here is, is that GitHub is a much, much smaller company than Google, okay? So they have one product, it's GitHub, right? You probably can, you know, probably at some point every GitHub developer knew each other because they met at a Christmas party or something. 
Um, but GitHub is a huge company, right? Uh, I, I don't even know how many people work there. But so, and they have many, you know, independent products, right? There's the, the query API, and there's the calendar API, there's the Gmail API, and there's some cloud stuff and so on, right? So um, you can imagine that, um, that there must be some sort of governance model around this, yeah? And you can, you can imagine that there is one guy at Google who owns these namespaces here, right? So, 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 so Google made the decision to use URLs to represent scopes, yeah? It doesn't matter what you're doing, they're just strings, right? GitHub used colons as a delimiter, they use forward slashes, okay? But the idea is, again, um, that in, in their case, uh, someone, I guess, will assign you uh, a namespace, and then underneath that, every team probably can decide on their own naming. That's a guess, at least, yeah? My, my point is, um, um, the, the OAuth itself does not give you any guidance or any advice how you should do that. That is a complete, you know, uh, organization decision, how you want to structure your API surface. And that, that's, a good, that's a good example for a big API surface, yeah? whereas GitHub is a little bit smaller. Cool. So that's one of the most confusing things that people ask me about, like, what's the scope? Why do I need it? Why doesn't the stack tell me exactly what it is? Yeah, because they didn't know 10 years ago, right? They just said, like, here's something, use it. Have fun. Good. Now, I mentioned earlier that the original spec had a couple of different what they call protocol flows. Um, and what they mean with a flow is that how a, a specific type of application um, can, can talk to the authorization server, basically. Yeah? And um, 10 years later, we found out that we only really need two of them. Because uh, it all boils down to we are, we are writing two types of applications these days non-interactive applications, like server-to-server, -server, batch processing, message queuing, and interactive applications, which is everything else that, that has a user in front of it, in the browser, in a, on a mobile device, whatever. So in OAuth 2.1, they boiled it down to exactly that. Here's how non-interactive flows work, and here's how interactive ones work. And everything else is a distraction. Okay? So, let's start with the simpler one, which is machine-to-machine -machine communication, right? No user is present, just two machines talking to each other. But still, you know, the API that the client calls needs authentication somehow, yeah? And it's really, really simple. Uh, let me show you how it works. So, here's our client, right, which might be a server-side process, whatever. Here are our resources, API 1, API 2, API 3, and so on. And here's the authorization server, yeah? Now, one requirement in OAuth is, is that the client is pre-registered with the authorization server, right? So you, an authorization server that, that does not hand out tokens to arbitrary unknown clients, yeah? So that, that there's typically a, a registration process happening first. That might be an admin thing, might be a self-service website where you register your client, whatever, right? So at the end of the day, the client will get issued from the authorization server a client ID, that's how you uniquely identify the client and a client secret that allows them to authenticate the client to the authorization server. So, and then it, when, when this client wants to have a token, it basically makes a round trip to the authorization server, says, hey, uh, please give me access to API 1. Okay? In this case, the client ID and secret is encoded on the authorization header using basic authentication. There are many other ways of doing it, like with certificates and public-private key pairs and, and so on. That doesn't matter, really. Um, point is, the client authenticates with the authorization server, asks for access to an API, and now the authorization server, and that's where the name is coming from, checks if that client is actually allowed to access the API, right? Again, there's some configuration on the server that way somebody determined, okay, this guy is allowed to access this. Yeah? Good, and if all is good, it will basically return you a response with a, with a JSON buddy with a thing called an access token. And that thing here, the access token, is now what the client will use to call the API. Now, how does an access token look like? That's an, another confusing thing in OAuth. Um, they didn't tell you, right? They, they said, you're going to issue an access token. Um, be, 
these days, yeah, today, it is very, very common that access tokens are in a JSON web token format, right? So the JSON web tokens are really just, is really just a way to um, crypt cryptographically secure a JSON object, right? With, with a signature, basically. And for making that work, you need some metadata like which key was used and which algorithm was used to sign the JSON object. And this JSON object encapsulates the authorization decision of the authorization server. Yeah? It says, okay, here's a client called client1, and I gave him access to API1. Okay? And here's my signature to prove that I am the right person that, did, that make, made this decision. Yeah? And the client receives that thing, which looks like this on the wire. Yeah? It's, it's encoded in Base64 URL, and then we'll use that um, to call the API. Now, guess what? All of the useful things we had in SAML tokens are still there because they are required. Yeah, it just looks simpler, right? <laughs> but it's, you know, uh, we, we still have the concept of an issuer and a signature, right? Um, the signature is here and it points to some key material at the trusted issuer. The issuer name is here as well. There's a time window. Issue IAT means issued at and EXP means expiration. That's the time window in which this token will be valid. And after that, it, it's, it's not. Yeah? Um, scoping is still there, right? Here's our scope parameter. And claims are also there. And in this case, it's a special claim called client underscore ID, which tells the recipient of the token who is calling me. Yeah? Cool. And then ultimately, the client will call the API by making a call to the resource and putting that token on the authorization header. Okay? There's a special thing called, coming from OAuth called bearer. And what bearer means is basically you are receiving an OAuth token. And then what the API will do, it will receive the token, read it, validate the signature. And once the signature is valid, it, it can trust the values inside the payload. And then it says, okay, um, I am API 1. This token is for API 1. All is good. Okay? Maybe they want to do additional authorization on the client ID or, or whatever other custom data you want to add, but that's in a nutshell how it works. Okay? So this, this talk is not really about code. Boom. <laughs> this talk is not really about code, but if you are interested in how that would look like in C sharp, that's how it looks like. Okay? You are creating a form, um, a form. You're putting in all the parameters, grant type, scope, client ID, and so on, and you're sending that to the token endpoint of the authorization server, right? And what you're getting back is the, the JSON object I just mentioned, which has the access token in it. Okay? And there are client libraries, of course, which make that much nicer and easier. And I wrote one, which is pretty popular as well, called, uh, called Identity Model which basically shields you from all of this, and you just say, give me a token, my, my client ID is this, my client ID is that, and here's the scope. Yes? Uh, it's been, yeah, I'm, I'm done with code. Bang. <laughs> Light mode. <laughs> okay? It's, it, this talk is not, not about code. I just want, you know, if, if, if somebody needs to see that for a moment in C Sharp, even if it's dark, that was the purpose of that. Okay? Good. So, now, very important and a very um, a source of confusion is um, there are some rules about access tokens. The first rule is, and it's the most important one that you should always remember, the client application is not allowed to touch it. Okay? The client should not make any assumptions what's inside of that token. The token format and the token contents are a private implementation detail between the authorization server and the resource server, right? The client is just a forwarder of that token, yeah? And, you know, I have customers that say, like, yeah, but it's a JSON web token. Can't I just look at it and get the stuff I want? Sure you can, but if the authorization server ever changes the format, your client will be broken. Right? So don't do it. Yeah? Access tokens are purely to be consumed by the API. And then there are some other boring rules, right? You need, you need to validate the signature, you need to check the issuer name, and that, that's all happening at the, at, at, at the receiver end in the API. Okay? But from a client point of view, you just get this string from the server, 
and you forward it to the API, and that's what you're supposed to do. Um, and if you are an API author, then you typically never do this yourself. There, there, there's libraries for that, right? In, in, in ASP.NET Core, there's the chart bearer authentication handler. You just tell him where, where is my issuer living, and it will auto-configure itself, validate signatures, do all of the time window checking, and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so that's, these days, it's pretty simple. Two things um, I also get a lot of questions about is, uh, what, what about status code? So, so you call the API. Yeah, if, if everything is fine, you probably get back a 200 with some data, right? But there are these, these two edge cases, well, I, I wouldn't call them edge cases, um, where not everything is fine, okay? And that is basically um, the 401 has a special meaning here, 401 unauthorized. And what the 401 means is basically you are trying to access a resource that requires a token, but your token is not valid, okay? might be missing, might be coming from a, non, from a different issuer that, that we trust, or the most common reason it's expired, right? Tokens have a limited lifetime. Um, you should not um, write your application in a way that it depends on the lifetime of the token, because again, the authorization server can change any time the lifetime of your token. Your application should always be written in a way that it can deal with expired tokens at any point in time. And when you, when you get back a 401, 99% of the times that means your token has expired, get a new one, okay? The other status code you are interested in is called 403, forbidden. And what that means is your token is totally fine, but the thing you are trying to access does not give you access, right? Some sort of authorization decision made by the, by the API. In that case, it it is not worthwhile getting a new token and trying it again, right? Because this probably won't fix your problem, yeah? So um, this is very important when you're writing a client application, yeah? So 403 basically means I can't do anything about this, right? I mean, I have to surface this error to someone who can fix this. Whereas 401 means let me get a new token and retry, right? That will probably fix the problem. If it doesn't fix the problem again, something is out of sync in your system, yeah? But as I said, 401 typically means I need to get a new token. Good. And that helps you with token management, yeah? So every client application out there must somehow manage their tokens, right? So you don't want to get a new token for every API call. That would not be the most efficient implementation. So what you typically want to do is you get a token, keep it in memory or in a cache or in a, in a database, and use it typically until you get a 401, which means it's expired. Then you get a new one, cache that again, and start over. Yeah, that's the, the, the typical implementation of that. And you know, in .NET, you can nicely abstract that away with um, HTTP message handlers and HTTP client that just gets the token. If, if a 401 gets returned, get a new token under the covers, try it again. And if it's still a 401, well, I can't do anything. Otherwise, it probably works. Yeah. Good. So. Let's do, if there are any questions, let, let's do, do them at the end, I guess, um, just in the interest of time um, that I'm getting through the content. But that's all you need to know about non-interactive applications, right? A server, talking to another server, to make that work, you, you get an access token and you use the token until it, it's not good anymore, then, then you get a new one. That's it. Yeah? The much more interesting types of applications, because they're more complex, are interactive applications, right? And that is where a human being, a user, is using the application interactively, right? Um, and this is, of course, always more complicated because, well, we, we involve human beings. That makes things always more complicated, yeah? Um, but also, you have to coordinate more things. Typically, you, you want to coordinate things like user authentication, uh, single sign-on maybe, joining some sessions or you know, doing some session lifetime management and so on. And that's where this approach here comes in, which is a little bit different. Yeah? So there's a special flow in OAuth called the authorization code flow. And that is specifically designed to deal with interactive applications. Um, and in particular, to be able to, during the authorization process of getting a token, be able to show a UI, right? Because humans like UIs. So um, in the server-to-server -server case, there are no UIs necessary, right? There are two machines. They don't need a UI, 
but if you are running the application um, in front of a human, you need that. So that's why in OAuth, the authorization code flow is split up into two logical steps. The first step is what we call the front channel. And the front channel is everything happening in the browser. So it's basically something that shows UIs to humans. Yeah? Login page, consent page, whatever, whatever UI is necessary to complete the token request. Yeah? Um, and then, and this is very important, we, um, we don't want to return that access token via the browser back to the client application because we don't trust the browser. Right? I mean, browsers are great. Yeah, they, they have a very nice feature that you can give them a URL and they just follow it, right? Browsers, browsers are very dangerous as well because you can give them a URL and they just follow it. So we want to uh, re reduce the exposure of sensitive data in the browser. And in OAuth case, that is the access token, okay? So what the front channel will return is not the token directly. It returns something called um, a, a code and that code can then be used in a second interaction by, by doing a server-to-server -server call to actually retrieve the actual token. Okay, so let's have a closer look at that. So, how does the front channel request look like? Basically, it's, it, it's, it's a redirect, okay? To, to the authorized endpoint, you put a bunch of parameters there, client ID, redirect URI, response type is code, scope, right, API 1. That's what we want to access. And now, a whole bunch of stuff kicks off in the browser, right? Probably the first thing you see is, is, is a login, right? If you are not inside of an existing single sign-on session, you will, you will see a login screen. You log in somehow, name and password, whatever, right? That login screen is running on the authorization server, meaning it's running on the same entity that is owning the resources, right? That's why it's trusted. Um, I mentioned the consent screen earlier, right? That's how a consent screen could look like. And the whole idea is, is to involve the human by giving the human a lot of information. Like, who am I? Who, are, who do I think you are? Who, is, who do I think the client is? What is the client asking for? Do you want to allow this, right? Um, some companies like Google and Facebook and so on, they show them all the time. Um, they often make a, make a distinction between first-party and third-party clients, right? So where a third-party Google client will show the screen or they show it for them, so to speak, whereas the, the Gmail app doesn't show it, right? So that's how they express like their level of trust, I guess. Um, and, you know, you should read what's on there, yeah? And it's hard to, to create a good, a good content screen that a normal human being who is not an OAuth expert can appreciate, yeah? But, yeah. Ultimately, 99% of the time, people will click this. And when that happens, we get back from the authorization server back to the client application a redirect with this thing called a code. Okay? The code is just a random string. It, 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 it means nothing, so to speak. But this code associates on the authorization server side uh, with the data that happened during the front channel interaction, right? Who is the user? Did they consent? What are the resources they consented to? Whatever, right? Um, but what we are returning here is just this random string. And the idea behind that is, is that if an attacker would be able to steal that random string, they cannot do anything with that. Because it's not usable data. To make that data usable on the back channel communication, the client opens a channel to the token endpoint and authenticates again with client ID and secret and passes along the code, right? And only, and there are many, many checks happening now, like is the client ID valid, is the client secret valid, is the client ID the same as the one on the front channel, all of these things that should happen, right? And if all of that is good, ultimately, the server will return the access token and a so-called refresh token on, on the back-channel communication, and then the client stores that data server-side, and then they can access the APIs. Okay? So, that, so that, that's how it always works. Yeah? And it's a little bit confusing to start with, but imagine front-channel is all about UI, and back-channel is all about now turning the outcome of the UI into tokens. Good. So how do user-centric access tokens look like? 
Well, they are pretty much the same, but there's one important addition here that it typically also has a, an identifier for the user that authenticated during the token request, right? Because now you want to be able to call an API and that API must know who the user is, right? Because they want to do authorization, yeah? So, um, that's a, in other words, that, that there were two steps of authorization happening. At the tokens, uh, at the authorization server level, they determine does client one have access to API one? That's the first thing, okay? And then once that token reaches the API, Typically, the API will do authorization decisions based on who is the user, right? Compare that to a Twitter client, right? Uh, the Twitter client connects to Twitter and it, it asks for permission to write to the timeline, right? That would be the scope, yeah? Write timeline. But then when the Twitter client is actually writing to the timeline, they must include for which user because you can't write to arbitrary timelines, right? Only the one of the user that has authenticated with you. Okay. So it's a two-step process, um, and that is sometimes a little bit confusing. What is the job of the authorization server? Only the upper part, only determining if the client is allowed to access the API. Anything else beyond that is business logic in the API itself. Good. Um, again, token management um, is more interesting here because you know, your, your access token might be valid for an hour. Yeah? But the application the user is using might run for five hours or five weeks or five years, right? Um, so how, what do we do if the access token is expired? We need a new one, but in the interactive flow, we saw we need to involve this front channel thing, right? Like go to the login page and all of that. And that would be a very bad user experience, right? Like you're, you're in the middle of typing something, suddenly the browser makes a redirect to a login page and comes back, your form is gone. That, that would suck. Yeah? So there's another thing here, an, an, another technique that is always used um, for this type of application called the refresh token. And the refresh token is, is just another token that, that allows you to get a new access token. Yeah, think of sliding cookies in the browser, right? In the browser, um, that happens automatically. In OAuth, you need to make that programmatically, meaning once your access token has expired, you take the refresh token, go back to the token server, get a new access token, and start using that until that one is expired and the whole thing starts over and over and over again. Yeah? So how does that work? Well, let's say um, our access token has expired, then the client application will go back to the token server, to, to the authorization server. It will basically hand the refresh token in, authenticate with the authorization server, and if all is good, you will get back a new pair of access and refresh tokens that you can use for the next time. Okay? Why are they doing it so complicated? Why don't they just issue an access token that lives for one year? Wouldn't that be much simpler? Well, for security reasons, right? Because if that access token is leaking and attacker stole it, right, they would, they would have access for one year to your data. And that's what we want to avoid, right? Um, access tokens should be short-lived. In this case, it's one hour. And after that one hour, the client has to go back to the authorization server, proof again that he's the right client to get back a new access token for another hour, right? And the nice thing we can do with this mechanism is, well, we can actually revoke refresh tokens, right? So many um, um, systems have that feature. That's the one from Google. They, they, they don't call it revoking a refresh token. They just say, here are apps connected to your account. And then you can delete the app from here. And what that technically does, it deletes the refresh token. So, so the next time this client comes along and tries to hand in the refresh token, it will say, no, you don't have access anymore. Okay? So in other words, um, the lifetime of the access token determines how quickly you can kick out a client out of your system. Right? So if the access token is valid for one hour, uh, and you delete the refresh token right at the start, it will take one hour before that kicks in. If you make the access token five minutes, it will only take five minutes, right? And it depends again what type of application you're building, what is the right value for you, right? Maybe banking applications, healthcare and so on, they have better, you know, stricter requirements than a restaurant rating app, right? Um, so that's an example of a self-service revocation style, but also OAuth specifies um, a programmatic revocation endpoint. So a well-behaved application that has a refresh token for a user 
um, should, once they are done with the user and say, like, I, I, you know, the, the user locked out, I don't need X anymore, they should revoke the refresh token programmatically, right? That would be good developer hygiene, I guess, by just going here and saying, hey, here, here's a refresh token I got from you, please invalidate it, revoke it. Okay, so that in any case, whatever happens, this thing will be not usable anymore. And also, you help your authorization server to keep your database smaller, right? By not having to keep all of that data that is stale. Yeah? Good. So, um, that is basically the two building blocks of OAuth. Machine to machine and interactive. Right? And now you can build a bunch of applications with that, yeah? Of course, the easiest one would be machine to machine, right? Two machines talk to each other. The, all the other examples of all of the other application types are basically things like web applications, right? Spas, web assembly applications, mobile applications, desktop applications, anything you can imagine that has a user interacting with. Okay? And as I said, the way I have that in my mind is it's either browser-based or not browser-based. Now, that's basically the things we build these days. Yeah? So, when we have a look at the typical browser-based application technology stack, and let, let's, let's use ASP.NET Core as an example, because that's what I'm doing all the time, um, it always looks very similar, right? You have a, a, a library, a client library for OAuth that can make all of these requests, right? That, that knows how to do the front channel thing, that knows how to harvest the, 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 the code, that knows how to turn the code into a token. All of that should not be your job. It should be the job of the programming framework you're using. And, and, and again, I can only really speak um, to ASP.NET Core, and they have a brilliant client library. It, it, it is very good. We worked on it for a long, long time, um, but it's, it is very good. Then you have session management, right? Again, uh, a typical web application will have a session, meaning uh, the, brow the, the, the user logs in and it, it will be valid for one hour, five hours, sliding expiration, maybe a week, you know, up to your, um, to your uh, business case. That is typically done with cookies because we're in the browser. Then we have some token management going on, right? And that is all about keeping the access token, keeping the refresh token, using the access token once it's expired, use the refresh token to create a new, get a new access token and keep going, okay? Um, this part here is unfortunately not inside of ASP.NET Core, but I, I, I've written a client, um, I, I, I've written a library for that which plugs into ASP.NET Core and I think I have a link to that in a, in a minute that helps you with all of that boilerplate code. And then you have UI assets, right? Um, and it really doesn't matter to me what kind of UI it is. Is it Razor Pages? Is it MVC? Is it React or Angular? Whatever. It's all the same, right? They are browser-based applications. Actually, if you want to know much more about this, I'm doing a talk after the um, lunch break about that particular architecture and how to get it right for Spars and Blazor web assemblies because that is still not as easy as it should be. Good. If you are not in the browser, guess what? You need a browser. Uh, <laughs> yeah? Um, the benefit of native, native applications is, is that they don't have to rely on the browser for the whole application lifetime, right? They, they just open the browser for authentication purposes. They point it to the authorized request. They get back the code and then do a, a, an HTTP call. But the authentication process should be run in a browser, yeah? Um, not everyone agrees with me on that, um, but it's definitely an anti-pattern these days to bring up your own native authentication dialogues in mobile apps, right? You're sending out the wrong signals here. You should send the user to the trusted authorization server on the trusted hardware where you have all your logging and, and the uh, auditing and fraud detection and whatever you have on that server. That's where the user should log in and nowhere else, okay? Again, remember, what was the starting point here? Not make the user expose credentials to a third party, right? And even if the mobile app is first party, you are sending the wrong signals to the user that this is okay. It's not, right? Um, studies show the less often you make a user sign into your system by having a good single sign-on solution, the less prone they are to phishing attacks. Right? Because the less often you have to type in your password, maybe the more you think about it when you have to. Yeah? 
So yeah, there's a chance to make stuff more secure just by guiding the user and not taking shortcuts. Good. So the last thing I want to touch on in the last eight minutes is um, you often maybe heard the sentence, yeah, but OAuth is not user authentication. And you're right, it is not. OAuth was designed to solve this one simple problem, how can a client application get an access token to access an API? Authentication is an implementation detail, right? Um, for, for, from an OAuth point of view, authentication is out of scope. Yeah, no pun intended, I guess. Um, so to make o OAuth more useful, um, to authentication, there are a couple of things missing. So look at that. That's how our authentication workflow works, right? On the front channel, we go here, we go back, get a code. The code is just a random number. On the back channel, we go here, uh, get, a, get an access token. Are we allowed to look at the access token? No, we are not. So from a client's point of view, you might now have an access token, but you don't know who the user is, right? So that's where OpenID Connect comes in. OpenID Connect is an authentication protocol on top that adds these things. For example, maybe on the way on the front channel, you want to influence the authentication experience for the user by saying like, hey, maybe you should show him the login page in Portuguese or in German or whatever, right? All of these parameters to influence the authentication experience, they don't exist in OAuth because it, it wasn't designed for that, right? Um, on the back channel, there should be some data flowing back here that the client is allowed to consume to figure out, hey, Dominic logged in, right? Um, and by the way, he logged in with uh, multi-factor authentication and his session is uh, two hours old. Are you okay with all of this before you let him into your application, right? All of that stuff does not exist in OAuth. And that's where OpenID Connect comes in by basically introducing all of these things, yeah? Like additional parameters on the authorized request to influence the workflow and additional data on the token response that the client can pass in a standard format to make more informed decisions about the user who just logged in, okay? So they call it the identity token, which is really a bad name for it because it has the word token in it. And it, people are sometimes confused now. Okay, we have access token, refresh token, identity token. Which one do I use now? Hmm. And the point is, um, if you are here in my talk, yeah, whenever you hear the word identity token, yeah, translate it in your head with authentication response. It's, it's the data that the authorization server sends back to the client to let the client know what happened on the server, right? That's a typical identity token here, yeah? So that is flowing back to the client and it says like, hey, subject ID is this, name is Alice, login time was that, authentication method was a password, yeah? And where does that data flow back? On the back channel, okay? So the front channel just works the same, but when the client exchanges the code with the, with the token, they get back the access token to call the APIs and they get back the ID token, which then they pass, validate the signature, pass it, and then can say, hello, Dominic, in the UI, because we know who you are. And before that, they didn't know because the access token is out of bounds for the client. Okay? Cool. So, that's it. You are now all OAuth experts. <laughs> But that's really all, I mean, you know, for, um, if you are more like a business developer, right, that's all you need to know how it works. If you are more of a security developer, then this is a good starting point, okay? So yeah, there are some interesting documents that you might want to read. First of all is the OAuth 2.1 spec. Um, you know, reading specs is not everybody's favorite thing to do, but I can tell you it's, it's useful. Um, here's the OpenID open Connect spec, and here, here you can see how OpenID open Connect layers on top of OAuth to add these additional features. Um, here's a blog post I wrote a couple of years ago, actually, where it says like, hey, all you need to remember is there are two flows in OAuth, forget the rest, okay? If anyone likes Della Soul. Um, <laughs> and some, some other stuff, okay? So, so that's it. Um, oh yeah, and if you want to go like really into the weeds, <laughs> 
then you can start reading all the specs on these pages here, where does the source of truth is coming from. That is what I do many times. <laughs> cool. Thank you. That was it. Um, do you have any questions? We have like three more minutes before we close. Yep. A what? Oh, you know, the IETF moves slowly. Um, in 2020, I said, it's going to be ready this year. In 2021, I said, it's going to be ready this year, I'm sure. This year, I would say, I think it's going to be ready this year. <laughs> um, but they are indeed in the last stages, right? So the ITF is a very democratic process, right? You bring people into a room and they can vote on stuff. And if somebody disagrees, they have to discuss it. You know, like all the wrong things about democracy. <laughs> um, so, yeah. It, it's, it's totally fine to reading it now because I think if something will change, it will be minor. And how you can prove to your colleagues that you are even a, a bigger geek than just reading specs, you can read the diffs be between the versions of the spec <laughs> and know exactly what has changed between revision 13 and revision 14. <laughs> okay? So yeah, no, it's fine. It, it's almost done. Nothing fundamental will change. That is the record. Don't read the original spec. Don't. Because that is just not useful. Read this one. Oh, it's gone. Read, read this one here, the, the upper one. I think that's the best, the best source. Okay? Yeah. No. <laughs> the access token is for accessing APIs. The identity token is a JSON object that tells the client application who the user is plus some added data, which happens to be a JSON web token. Okay? It's just a way to get this JSON object from server back to client without, you know, with a signature, so it can't be tampered with. Typically, the ID token is a thing you only consume once. You read it, once it's valid, and then you throw it away. No. By the, with the authorization code. The talk is being recorded. <laughs> so if you want to watch it again and again, it's, yeah, the authorization code gives you the ID token and the access token, and that, that's it, really. Yep. Good. Thank you very much. See you around. <laughs>